I, I'm still going to come back to seeing if we can convince Alex to commit to going all remote by the end of this call. But let's uh, let's go through some of the, the other fears that that exist out there, which again you addressed in this tweet thread. And so the next one is um, collaboration. I've heard this a lot. People are like you know creative work it just needs to be done in person, and that's just you know product teams need to be together. And um, so, but you address that very clearly, where shared Google Docs are actually more effective than physical whiteboards. Can you please elaborate on that a little bit more, Sid? Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking. So I think whiteboards are great for two things. They're great for drawing arrows to connect items. It's harder in a Google Doc. And they're great for grouping stuff with circles. That's much harder in a doc. However, with a Google Doc, you have 15 advantages compared to that. Everyone can write not just a mostly senior person who's in front of the room with the marker. Multiple people can write at the same time. We had a sales training and it went twice as fast. Why? Because the person with the marker was in the bottleneck. When they said, everyone put down an idea, boom, you had 15 per cursors at the same time, you had 15 ideas. You can see in real time where everyone is looking. If I have a room full of people, I don't know where they're looking on the whiteboard. Here I can see the cursor. Everyone can make suggestions. You can make kind of con comments that are like time stamped. Like you can, you can see who did what at what time. In a whiteboard, you don't see that. You can change the hierarchy with indentation, change it back and forth. You can copy paste stuff. You don't run out of space. It doesn't need to be deleted after the meeting. It can be iterated on prior to the meeting. Like you can prep and already have an outline there. It's the agenda transforms into the notes during the meeting. Like up front, it's the agenda and then you add to it. It's much more readable than the handwriting sometimes is. You can use URLs, you can use the internet. We, we invented hypertext. It's great, you can dump a URL in the Google Doc. I, I challenge you to go click a whiteboard. It doesn't do anything. You can add screenshots, you can embed stuff. And that Google Doc becomes an artifact that can be shared much more easily than I sometimes went home from stuff and you, you get a big roll of paper with everything you've wrote down. Nothing happens to those, never. And you can share it globally and invite other people. It is far superior. A Google Doc is superior to any whiteboard. No, it's not a match. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree with you. Um, personally, I love writing. But what I find is I get pushback from people in the company. They say, Alex, I don't collaborate through writing. I don't think through writing. I need to talk. I need to some ideas, someone to bounce ideas off. That's and I'm fine. Wondering, That's fine. Like, it, yeah. I think as a remote company, um, you can be synchronous. Some people love talking. It tends to be synchronous. They tend to not set send WhatsApp voice messages or Twitter voice messages soon. So that can work as long as you're not across multiple time zones. Like there's a whole difference between all remote in the same time zone and all remote worldwide. And that's a, that's a big jump. And we solved a ton of stuff at GitLab, but we didn't solve time zones. If you wanna, if you wanna solve time zones, you need to go asynchronous and then it's writing instead of talking. So for those people, as long as you keep the same hours, I don't think there's a problem. You could just, if they like talking more, they go hop on a Zoom call. By the way, yeah. you have some transcript bought by the down, so you actually get some materials produced. Yeah. How do you deal with that, Sid? How do you deal with teams that are globally spread? But is there any element of synchronous, communi synchronous communication that yeah, has to sure, happen? For sure there is. And uh, naturally, it, it, it's hard to keep it into asynchronous communication, but for example, get out of it as soon as it's not functional. So if you go back and forth with a colleague like two times, hop on a call together because that's way more efficient than going back and forth in chat. So we really stimulate to jump to synchronous as soon as the asynchronous uh, becomes tedious. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And then let's keep going again through this Twitter thread that you had and all the points that you're bringing up there. So I'm just, I'm gonna jump around a little bit, but I'll sort of grab what I think are the biggest ones first. And we've already gone through a few of them. But the next is, is that people fear that, and Alex just, just said it. He said, listen, there are a bunch of my people who I love and I wanna to continue to be with. And they said, 
that they need to go back in person. So if he doesn't give them that option, they're leaving the company. But you say the opposite of that side, which is watch out, Alex, because if you go back in hybrid, the people who now are really productive remotely, they will leave the company for the all remote because they will realize that the path to success is they'll be disadvantaged in a company that's hybrid if they're not in the office. And so the ones who are really productive and, and remote will go to a place that is all remote where they won't be disadvantaged. Can you please elaborate? I mean, maybe I just said it for you. You know, I just- Yeah, so but, people need the social bonds. And if you didn't organize informal communication, the past couple of months have been aware on those bonds and people no longer feel connected and they want that connectivity back. They don't want to go back to the office. They want to go back to informal communication with each other so they can restore these bonds. So it's a translation problem of, of had the office stood for informal communication. That's what, that's, the, that's, that's what they need. And if you can provide it in a different way, it will very likely work out for the majority of those people based on my sample size of just my wife. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the hybrid thing, it's so tempting. And you see every CEO in the world giving into it. And I think it's going to be a really big problem. I've, I've not seen great hybrid companies. I've seen great remote companies. I've seen great co-located companies. I've not seen a great hybrid company, but we're going to see there's some very smart founders like the founders of Spotify that say, hey, we're no longer going to have uh, conference rooms. It's going to be single person rooms because if you're hopping on a conference, you're going to each dial in individually. So everyone has a cursor, everyone has a webcam, everyone has audio, and the people being remote can see the faces of the people in the meeting. I think that's super smart. So we're going to see of the, if the brightest minds of our generation can pull it off to do hybrid. But I'd say it's a bit of a risk because it's never been done before. Matt, and the other policy yeah. here is there's only two places to work, at home or the office. At GitLab, we'll reimburse you if you need to go to a co-working space or an external office because we know that not every home is amenable to remote. I don't think enough leaders are thinking about that. There are other options other than the two. And many people that quote unquote, can't wait to get back to the office, as Sid, as Sid said, really they just can't wait to get out of whatever situation they're in in quarantine, which you can't really fault them for. That's right, that's right. But again, Sid, you pointed out the ways to make people feel um, comfortable with remote by creating that informal communication. But the angle I was going down was that watch out, if you come back to hybrid and you have, and the leaders are in the headquarters, and then the leaders do not are not careful about doing what Spotify is doing. And so the, the communications become informal within the office. Relationships get built within the office. People get promoted with who are physically in the office. Then the people who are remote, even though they're allowed to be remote, will start to realize, wait a second, I'm not getting all the information I need. I'm not getting the promotion that I deserve. And therefore, they'll say, this is basically BS. Why am I in this company that isn't valuing me fully? I'm going to go to a place that will value me fully. And so Alex is talking about the fear of losing the people who need to be in person, but you're pointing out where the, where the fear really should be about losing these incredibly productive people who are remote. Exactly. Okay. Is there anything I missed there? Because I don't want, I'm, no, I, it, I it's think more powerful coming from you than from me. It's, it's spot on. And it's it's and it's gonna it's not gonna take them a long while to figure it out. It's gonna they're gonna be very reluctant to change jobs. So that's a long incubation time. But you don't have to be not invited to a meeting or sorry, I forgot to tell you that we decided it in a whole way conversation. That doesn't have to happen that often, and you know. And then it can still take years before they actually leave, but they know really, really fast. Um, and it's hard. I run an old remote company. It's super hard to reinforce working handbook first. It's super hard to reinforce the informal communication. I could not run a hybrid company. Now there's better leaders out there than me, but I think it's an order of magnitude harder. It's not like, oh, you need to do two things. No, you need to do two things that conflict. I think it's impossible.